Hello everyone, it's 1 p.m. Eastern Time, and you know what that means. It's time to begin another of our monthly Kokoros, Koko, ooh, I don't know I pronounced that, Kokoros Weather Talk webinars. There we go. Uh, thanks for joining us today. I'm your host, Henry Regis. Running the technical side of our program is our own Noah Newman, and somewhere out there in the background is Kokoros founder, Nolan Duskin. We're coming to you live from the Colorado Climate Center here at Colorado State University in sunny Fort Collins, Colorado. For those of you who are unable to join us for our live broadcast, we'll be recording it for future viewing on our website. All of our Weather Talk webinars are sponsored by grants from the National Science Foundation and from donors from listeners just like you. Well, during today's webinar, we're going to talk about outdoor weather safety. Have you ever been out at this, a sporting event and the skies begin to darken, uh, thunder starts to roar? Well, wh where do you go? What do you do? We'll be talking about that very subject today. And to do so, we're very fortunate to have with us the National Weather Service National Decision Support Services Program Manager. That's, that's a big title there, a long title. Charlie Woodrum. Charlie, a uh, good friend of ours, and Charlie originally boats from West Virginia, holds his meteorology degree from Florida State University. We met Charlie when he was a journeyman forecaster back in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Well, Charlie, welcome. It's great to have you with us today, and thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule. Uh, I've got a question for you. Earlier this week, you mentioned that you, uh, your interest in outdoor weather safety began at a West Virginia Auburn football game in, back in 2009. Can you tell us a little bit about that? I sure can. Thanks for having me on today, Henry. Uh, I was, I'm an avid sports fan. I love college football and I love college basketball and I, I love going to different outdoor venues across the country. And uh, I'm a meteorologist and I've loved weather obviously since I was in second grade. So sports and weather are my, are my top two uh, things that I, I love to study and whenever I can marry the two, it's awesome. Um, so I, I, in 2009, I was uh, still in the Wilmington, Ohio forecast office as a Met intern at the time, getting ready to start as a forecaster in Pittsburgh. Uh, went down to Auburn, Alabama for a West Virginia Auburn football game. I try to follow my West Virginia Mountaineers when I can and go to some road games. And went down to Auburn, and um, the tailgating scene was great, and we're having a good time. We uh, are walking to go into the game, and uh, Storms are forecasted to hit the area, uh, hit the stadium uh, around the time of kickoff, and uh, the staff did a really good job there at Auburn uh, in preparing the stadium for what was going to be a deluge of, of heavy rainfall, which had flooded parts of the field briefly, and, and lightning, the major t threat being cloud-to-ground lightning. And they did a really good job evacuating the venue before the storms hit, and once they evacuated the venue, that the venue they actually had event staff keeping people from going down into the stands, and so a lot of people were coming into the game and didn't know there was a delay, and they took uh, did a really good job of keeping people in, uh, out of harm's way and under the bleachers in the concourses, and I and they also had closed caption or uh, closed circuit TV, which. Uh, provided information for everyone, and those were all around the concourses. So I was thinking, you know, wow, this is a great example of, of how a stadium should do a, a lightning delay. This isn't, this isn't chaotic. People aren't confused. The information's clear. We need to make sure other, other stadiums are, are doing this all across the country. We need to take Auburn's example and apply it nationally across the country. So I took the two things I love most, weather and sports, uh, and, uh, and I put them together and developed a lightning safety plan for outdoor venues, and that was uh, back in 2009, so this has really taken off since. Uh, we're now, I think the lightning safety plan's been in place for six years, so um, I, I'll be covering today uh, as, as we're going through things, uh, talking about the different preparedness programs that we have uh, for outdoor venues and for preparedness. I know we have a mixture of observers from the public meteorologists, uh, all kinds of different folks that are here on this call today. So I'm going to talk a lot about, you know, how, what we can all do to help venues prepare because it's far beyond what a meteorologist can do to help a, a venue prepare for, for uh, a lightning delay or for any other kind of hazard that could impact an outdoor venue. 
So uh, this slide I have here is, is you know, we really thought we'd seen everything. We'd had lightning delays. You know, we'd had some close calls with lightning strikes. And, and then we had these events, 2005, Hurricane Katrina. The Louisiana Superdome took major damages. Uh, and LP Field uh, had the flooding in Nashville, Tennessee in May of 2010. That's the flooding that came up as uh, the river came up there locally and flooded the field there. Cowboys Stadium, lower left, we had uh, ice sliding off the sides of Cowboys Stadium with a, a mixed precipitation event. Someone was actually injured uh, when the ice slid off the roof of Cowboys Stadium and struck them. And then Ralph Wilson Stadium, we had a record-setting uh, snow, snowfall from lake effect snow, over 80 inches of snow in some areas there. Uh, and the, you can see the stadium just covered with the snow there with that uh, just just monu uh, just a, a, an, a, an amazing amount of snow that they got there, feet and feet and feet of snow. And uh, they had to change their operations around because of the heavy amounts of snow there. So we're not just talking lightning. I mean, it's really about stadiums being resilient and having plans for all different weather hazards. Um, so I do want to go into the, uh, the, the basics of some lightning facts with you guys and talk about the motivation for why this is a big concern and, and how the National Weather Service has some ways to work with outdoor venues to, to help them get plans and recognize them, particularly with lightning. And we can talk about some of those partnerships and what we can do to take next steps. So in the, in the most basic form, I, I want to lay the foundation here with talking about how lightning forms. So a thunderstorm typically has an updraft and a downdraft uh, within the thunderstorm. And, and you know, the, the moisture condenses in, within, a thunder, within a cloud. The cloud develops. You get that moisture in that, it, within that, that cloud. And with instability, that moisture actually get pushed up aloft. And you'll see that cloud grow into what, could, what is normally, with a thunderstorm, a towering cumulonimbus cloud with that distinct updraft and downdraft. So you've got these moisture particles that are getting pushed up up in the up higher and higher in the in the up in the atmosphere, temperature decreasing loft actually goes all the way below freezing and you see hail start to develop. Those water molecules they start to freeze up and form hail. So you actually have those water droplets becoming ice particles up in the cloud. And so with the updrafts and downdrafts, you've got these ice particles getting pushed up and down in a thunderstorm, going up and down. And actually what happens is they start to collide with each other. And that collision starts uh, and, and induces an electric charge. And so it's that electric charge that both negatively and positively develops within a thunderstorm. And that's what helps uh, lightning develop. Typically, we see negatively charged particles go to the bottom of the storm. Uh, and positive charges go to the top. And so most often, um, Close to 90% of the time, you see negative lightning strikes uh, come down to the surface. And those are the most frequent ones that we see. However, there are some rare times where the positive strikes come out of the top of a thunderstorm cloud, go out the side and strike down. And those can go out 10, 15, 20 miles from a thunderstorm. So you see a, an example of one of those positively charged strikes. In the bottom left picture here, we call that a bolt from the blue. Um, those have been recorded. A 20, and I've even seen further than 20 miles from a thunderstorm, and those can be deadly lightning strikes. So we've got our cloud to, cr uh, cloud, to cloud on the right picture, our cloud to ground lightning strikes, which obviously are our most frequent uh, lightning strikes that we see that impact outdoor venues. So all, all are things to be aware of. I just want to clear the air a little bit with some lightning myths, some very common lightning myths. And I'll be honest, I, as much as I hate to admit this, I, I I didn't even realize just coming into the weather service that, you know, I always thought, oh, lightning strikes metal, metal at high places. Uh, and, and I was quickly told, well, no, not, no, it's not that lightning's attract, uh, it's not that lightning is uh, attracted to metal. So that what we have listed here is that lightning is attracted to metal. That's a myth. Uh, the lightning isn't actually attracted to the metal. Lightning tends to strike the tallest object. So whether it's a tree or a metal post, it's going to try to strike the tallest object. And so metal is a conductor of electricity. So the electricity from a lightning strike will, tra will travel quickly uh, if lightning strikes uh, something that's metal. But it's not attracted to that metal. Uh, lightning never strikes the same place twice. It, it will 
Uh, it can strike tall objects many times, in a year even. Empire State Building has been struck so many times, going back to the fact that lightning tends to strike the tallest objects. Here's another very common one, is that rubber tires on a car protect you from lightning. Uh, no, actually, it is the metal uh, cage in your fully enclosed metal vehicle that creates something called a Faraday cage, where lightning strikes the metal vehicle and the electricity goes all around uh, you inside of your vehicle. It won't strike through the vehicle. And the rubber has nothing to do with why you're protected there. And the last one uh, applies to our outdoor venues as we're getting into spring uh, and summer baseball season here, and that's dugouts are completely safe. Dugouts are partially open. They're not fully enclosed. So any shelter that's taken that's partially open is not completely safe from a lightning strike. So something important to remember. As we look at the climatology, well, not so much the climatology, but let's just look at back through 2000, from 2006 to 2013 at where our fatal... Uh, uh, lightning incidents, how many we've had over, over the different months, and you'll see very evident here that most of our fatal lightning incidents have occur occurred in the summer months, June, July, and into August. You'll see that ramp up there. And uh, coincidentally, that occurs when a lot of our outdoor sporting events, we've got so many Major League Baseball games throughout the summer, so, much, so many outdoor activities occurring with the peak of lightning season, with the most lightning strikes occurring this summer. Uh, as a result, we see the most fatal lightning strikes that occur in the summer months as well. So uh, definitely coincides with uh, our outdoor events, making it a, a high risk. So there are some very specific examples I have where people have been struck at, at events or outside of events. Uh, Pocono Raceway was hosting a NASCAR race back in 2012. The race was canceled partway through, um, but the spectators waited all the way until the race was canceled. Uh, and, and to leave the stands. Even though storms were clearly approaching the, the Pocono Raceway, there was the possibility that uh, uh, they could have called for the delay before. But, you know, we've learned that fans won't leave the stands until an event is stopped. So if, even if the, uh, an evacuation were called for of an event and the race continues or the football game keeps going, unless you stop that race or stop that football game, the fans are going to stay in the stands, so really to get them out of the stands, the event needs to be stopped. This was an unfortunate example where someone was out, uh, out by their car. They'd, left the, they'd actually left the racetrack, and they were struck by lightning outside of their vehicle and killed. And nine others were injured from the lightning strike. So it's a very real threat that lightning can kill at outdoor events. The next example I, I, that I think is motivation for all of us that we need to keep doing more and more outreach and preparedness with large venues uh, for, for lightning safety and for hazardous weather is uh, the 2013 opening game. Baltimore, the Baltimore Ravens were playing the Denver Broncos that day, and uh, right in the middle of the first quarter, they had a lightning delay. And there's a couple of things that you'll notice that are odd about this lightning delay. I first want to point out the bottom right picture. You've got the NBC announcers who are down on the field during the lightning delay. So, so they're putting themselves at risk. So if you're a fan in the stands during a lightning delay and you see uh, announcers down on the field, that really sends a mixed message because you're like, why the announcers are down on the field. Why do I need to leave my seat during this lightning delay? They, if they're safe down there, I must be safe here in my seats too. That's not true. And they really sent... Uh, the wrong message by being out on the field there during the lightning delay. The next thing I want to point out here is our, in our upper left picture is that there are several things that could be done uh, to adjust this uh, messaging on the uh, public display there on the Jumbotron that could make this a more effective message. One, it says severe lightning storm. Lightning, uh, a thunderstorm with lightning doesn't make it severe. In order to be severe, you've got to have hail greater than an inch in diameter and winds that are over 58 miles per hour. So for one, it sends the wrong message because it wasn't a severe thunderstorm. There, weren't, there wasn't hail. There wasn't a wind threat. It was just a lightning threat. So it wasn't a severe storm. Then uh, you, uh, in the message, in the smaller text below it, you can see it says, if you feel the need, take cover in a sheltered area. So that sends the mixed message. It's not sending a very powerful, strong message that is telling folks they need to take cover. It's giving them an option, which obviously, as you can see, the fans in the stands 
aren't leaving the stands. The stands are, are full. And you see the announcers down there. The stands are full during the lightning delay. So we have to have stronger messages on the public address systems. So uh, 2013, we had a severe, a severe event that was outlooked a, with the threat of tornadoes several days in advance by the Storm Prediction Center. Out four days in advance, they were highlighting the potential for a, a somewhat unusual tornado outbreak for a portion of the Midwest in November. And they were talking about this being a possible tornado day several days well in advance. And there, it, the day was going to be Sunday, November 17th, and there was a Chicago Bears game scheduled for 1 o'clock in the afternoon. That coincided with when a tornado watch had been issued that morning, a PDS tornado watch, which is a particularly dangerous situation, outlooking the potential for long-lived, fast-moving tornadoes that day. Chicago was included in that tornado watch. And I, I like to use this example because it shows how uh, stadiums really can be proactive uh, in making a decision to call, call for the change of the starting time of an event. They didn't do it in this game, and they had, a, a they had storms that moved in close to about 2 o'clock, and fans were in the stands. The game was ongoing, and they delayed the game, and there was a tornado warning just south of Chicago. And could you all imagine if a tornado had hit downtown Chicago while this game was going on? Even if, even if fans evacuated, they'd be out in the streets or going to their cars or in the concourses, not in completely safe places from a tornado. So this is a good example where outdoor venue managers and professional sports organizations really can look at the forecast and see that when we have high confidence, it's a good idea to go ahead and change the game time. They could, and there are, there are obviously things they have to weigh on their end too, such as the financial ramifications, uh, not as many spectators attending when you change the game time, lose the loss of concession stands uh, sales, but it's really not worth the, worth the alternative, which is having someone fatally killed in the stands at an NFL football game. And that's something I've worked with our outdoor organizations, national sports organizations on, is taking proactive measures to change game times. This game could have been changed to 8 o'clock, and it wouldn't have been impacted by thunderstorms at all. So we can really, when as meteorologists, when we have high confidence in an event occurring, these high-impact events are really when our national sports organizations should be taking proactive measures in order to change game times. Uh, and even more recently, we've had lightning strikes just at the end of the 2014-2015, last year's NFL season. We had a lightning strike outside of Raymond James Stadium in the parking lot, and two were struck, uh, and seven were injured. And you're probably wondering, how were others injured if uh, only two were struck? Well, when the lightning struck, it actually kicked a bunch of rocks out there in the parking lot, and several people were injured by the flying rocks that happened after the lightning strike. So it can happen, and we have had some tornado warnings more recently, just within the past year, that have impacted outdoor events. There was a St. Louis Cardinals baseball game going on back in June of last year. And you can see in this left graphic, there's a tornado-worn storm, a supercell thunderstorm, moving towards downtown St. Louis there uh, with an ongoing St. Louis Cardinals game. So they have a really good good uh, system there with their team and preparing for, for severe weather. And they had called for the delay, uh, put fans in concourses, moved people to fully enclosed locations, did what they could proactively to make sure fans were in the safest place they could be. Thankfully, although this storm did drop tornadoes, it didn't uh, impact downtown St. Louis, and Bush Stadium wasn't impacted. But could you imagine what would happen if it were? Even those folks there in the concourses would be at risk of, of getting injured if a tornado were to hit Bush Stadium. It's really the worst case scenario, a tornado hitting a stadium with people in it. So it's something we got to continue to think about with large outdoor venues is what would you do if you had a tornado? Can you put people underground? Do you have large, fully enclosed structures that are safer places than an open venue? And sometimes you really, there aren't, there aren't fully enclosed tornado large shelters that can hold 20, 30 plus thousand people. And really what you got to do then is get people to the safest place possible. This past college football season, we had a Southern Miss 
University of Texas El Paso UTEP game that was scheduled for October 31st to kick off at about 2.30 in the afternoon and thunderstorms were forecast to move through that day and the game was already ongoing. Fans were in the stands and a line of, of storms were, were approaching. Tornado watch is in effect and uh, the line actually developed a tornadic circulation within it, uh, embedded circulation within it as it was moving through. You can see the storm there headed right into Hattiesburg or Hattiesburg, which is where the University of Southern Miss is and where their stadium was. And uh, you can just kind of see a little bit of a, a couplet with your velocity on the right here, your uh, green inbounds and your red outbounds uh, here uh, with the rotation from that. And that's, that's coming from the New Orleans radar there. So uh, you can see your inbound and your outbound there giving you your rotation. Uh, just just getting into Hatt or Hattiesburg there with an ongoing football game. So they had to take the measures of delaying the game because of an approaching storm with not only lightning but a tornado threat. And uh, again, uh, going under the bleachers, unfortunately, although it keeps you dry, is not going to protect you from a tornado. If they're partially open bleachers, it's not going to protect you from a lightning strike. Uh, partially open covers or shelters are, are not completely safe from a lightning strike. So. These are things we're continuing to have venue managers think about is what would you do in this case? And thankfully, although a tornado, an EFZ or a tornado did touch down in Hattiesburg, Mississippi, uh, thankfully it didn't impact those at the, at the game. So here's a map of all the different lightning delays that occurred at uh, Bowl Championship Series, formerly known as 1A and NF in college football and NFL games for this past fall season. So you can see, although you know you would expect mo most of the lightning strikes in the fall probably to be in the southeast, the most lightning to occur you know, in Florida. And uh, really, events can be impacted all across the country during football season. We've seen delays in previous seasons in, in Seattle. The Seattle Seahawks game had a lightning delay. We've seen delays in California. Even in this map, you can see Utah, Colorado, Minnesota, all across the country there were lightning delays this past year. So several different uh, venues were impacted. And it's not just the beginning of the season either. Interesting scenario occurred with TCU. Uh, TCU was playing Baylor in November towards the end of the year. And the game actually got had a lightning delay. It was a colder system, a cold front moving through. And uh, their temperatures quickly dropped into the 30s and 40s when the front came through. But there was lightning with that front as it came through, and they had to delay the TCU-Baylor game. So we're talking about a threat throughout the football season, certainly. So this threat starts, you know, uh, the spring. It, it could happen any time in the year. We could certainly have thunderstorms, as we learned yesterday and the day before with the tornadoes in the southeast and then across the mid-Atlantic. We can have thunderstorms any time of the year. They could be tornadic any time of the year, and they can pr obviously produce lightning any time of the year. So this is a threat to outdoor venues any time, but we certainly have seen this. Uh, both in Major League Baseball and in college football, uh, as well as professional. Here's a map that uh, Alex Lamers, who's a forecaster in Tallahassee, maintains. He did a study on the average percent of hourly observations at different airports across the country that had uh, thunder. And he looked at, uh, particularly was interested in looking at uh, college football venues across the country. So he looked at Saturdays from noon to midnight uh, between September and November. And what you can see in this map is the orange larger circles, the hot spots, are where lightning occurred most frequently during these hours. The blue dots coincide with lightning strikes that occurred but less frequently. And you can see all across at these different venues, uh, whether it be in southeastern Washington, Washington State, uh, all the way over into Massachusetts, college venues all across the country, there were recorded lightning strikes at these locations between noon and midnight in the fall in the fall months uh, going from September into November. So Alex Lamer's study really does show that, that lightning could impact any venue. The statistics show that with when we've had lightning strikes. As we looked at who as Alex looked at who had the most thunderstorms across the country, probably doesn't come as a surprise that our our locations that had the most lightning strikes were in Florida. Uh, our top five, actually, were all college 
colleges that are in, in Florida. And then that, our top 20 expand all the way from Arizona eastward to Florida. So really uh, across the south is where we saw the highest thunderstorm rates through this time period. I wanted to uh, take another example. We've, we've talked a lot about a lot of scary situations where had something have happened, it could have been a, it could have been a worst case scenario where people could have been hurt or even killed with these. And we thankfully had, aside from Pocono, mostly had some good breaks. We did have some injuries in Tampa as well. But most of the time we've had delays where people have taken action and, and we haven't had injuries or deaths. Um, and this was a really good example. USC played Syracuse back in 2012 at MetLife Stadium in a neutral venue, and they had a delay, which happened to, to work pretty well because it happened right around the time of halftime, so people wanted to go to the stands anyway. But I want to point out a few things that they did really well with this delay. One, you'll see that there's a very clear uh, message that's there on the jumbotron there on the display board. For your safety, we're going to have everyone leave the stadium seating area, take shelter until the sta in the stadium because of lightning being in the area. And then as you can see on the scrolling marquee there below it, um, there's information saying that there's staff that are available to guide and assist, and those on the field, please walk calmly to, sh to shelter. So they, as you can see, the stands are completely clear. People took this very serious. You can see the fans all lined up there in the concourse. I will say that because if it's a partially open concourse, they are still at the risk of a lightning strike. So something to keep in mind if you're at an outdoor event and you go for shelter under the stands, if it's partially open, you're still, you're still in danger. Another really good job of, of display board messaging is what Michigan State did during their delay against South Florida. You can see here, very clear, special weather statement, extreme weather, please exit the stadium. And what I really like here is they put to your vehicle and then put locations of where people could go to be completely safe. And then they put a message at the bottom saying, when it's deemed safe, the stadium will reopen and they'll let people know that they can reenter the venue. So they actually had some issues with this. Even though the messaging was so good, they, they actually had a situation here where the, uh, um, actually where <laughs> The students refused to leave, and students actually end up being uh, attending normally in a first-come, first-served type ticket basis. And uh, I have a video here where the, the coach, Tom Izzo, actually addresses this with the students. And so I'll pull this video up here for you. And this is a best practice here of what Michigan State did. And we'll just do this. And hopefully you guys can hear this OK. Happy with me in a minute, but you gotta you gotta understand something that's really important to me, and that's all of you. And listen. Oh, didn't even lose the game yet. You're mad at me. I would sit right in the middle of your section and have a hell of a time. So that's a really good example of, of just how 
there were a lot of things that Michigan State did well there. Um, they, they had a local celebrity that people recognized and were familiar with. Tom Izzo, the head coach of the basketball team, they have a, a very well-renowned college basketball team that people were familiar with. And the students know the, the college basketball coach, so when he comes out with a the microphone, they get excited. They're going to listen to him. So you want a well-respected individual to go out, and, and we've seen this as a best practice, that when you get someone that everyone's familiar with that says, hey, this really is a threat, people will listen. And so they, Tom Izzo did a really good job getting the students to evacuate the stands there. Uh, and, and also talked about the radar. He mentioned the putrid color of yellow, that's the color of Michigan. And that got them excited too. And But but what really what I point, wanted to point out there is that they had the radar on the display board. And social science studies have shown that you need a second source of information. People typically need a second source of information to confirm and take action. So they're getting the announcement from the public address system. But then by looking up on the public display board and seeing that radar there, that's that second source of, wow, the storm really is headed this way. We need to take action. So uh, the NWS uh, outdoor safety programs that we have that are available for everyone to take uh, and and approach local venues with are, we have the Weather Ready Nation Ambassador Program. Venues can become Weather Ready Nation Ambassadors. We have the Storm Ready Supporter Program, which has been out uh, over oh, much over 10 years, 10, 15 years now, uh, giving people the opportunity and venues to become Storm Ready Supporters. We have several teams that are Storm Ready, I'll mention here shortly. And also, uh, the, the one that I really want to focus on, and that's the lightning safety plan for outdoor venues that enables venues to make educated decision, decisions with plans in place. So here's an example of a partner that we had that actually the Lakeland Center, they were recognized for being storm ready, becoming a weather ready nation ambassador, and completing the lightning toolkit. So I always say they get the gold star because they, they completed all of our outdoor recognition programs. So we have several different lightning safety plans that are available across the uh, for everyone to apply. And uh, it, we're not just talking about large outdoor venues here for the lightning threat. We also have plans that are available for lifeguards and beach patrols, for community events all across the country. And more recently, we've got a new plan out that's available for golf courses to apply. Uh, so they have a plan for lightning. I am going to focus on back on outdoor venues here, for, uh, and that'll be the primary focus here. And then we'll, we'll t touch briefly on the other plans. So. We do have uh, a couple of different pieces of information that are out there. There's the NCAA Sports Medicine Handbook. They have Guideline 1E for lightning safety. And they've actually revised it now. Uh, in 2015, they revised it. And now they've, they've taken what their previous statement was, and they previously said that stands need to be cleared by the time lightning comes within six miles of a venue. The problem there was that requires action when the storms are much further out than six miles. You need, you need action to be taken you know, when storms are 10, 15, further than that out in order to ensure that the stands are cleared when lightning gets within six. The problem here was a lot of venues were taking that verbatim and waiting until lightning got within six miles of the venue to call for the delay, which was too late in many cases. And the University of Tennessee had a game against Oregon where they had a lot of fans still trying to evacuate as storms moved through because they didn't take that proactive uh, they didn't make that proactive decision early enough because six because six miles wasn't enough, and that led them to making their their rule eight miles there at the University of Tennessee, and and thankfully in a, the revised version of this guideline in 2015, they're now recommending that evacuations occur occur um, further out, saying that lightning can be deadly and can can strike from eight to ten miles out. So they've gotten away from six miles, which which we're really happy to see with the NCAA or NOAA NCAA guidance now coming for closer into line with what NOAA, the guidance that NOAA has put out there. There's also the, um, the NATA, the National Athletic Trainers Association, they have a position statement on lightning uh, and continue to update information for athletic trainers because a lot of times they're at practices and outdoor uh, events that may not have a lot of, of spectators at them, but the team is still at risk of getting struck by lightning. And a lot of times athletic trainers have to be wary of that for their team. So just to kind of give a quick rundown of what specifically is in the Lightning Safety Toolkit, it, it's a, basically a template uh, that, that provides guidance for outdoor venues that they can turn into their own plan. They can fill out the template. And it, it has them designate a weather watcher, someone who's responsible for 
keeping an eye and a situation and situational awareness on weather. It talks about how to train staff, inform fans, and 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 identify where safe places are, what safe structures are for shelter. In addition, it has our guidance that evacuation must occur at a minimum if lightning is within eight miles of that event. And we also have recommendations for actions to be taken if storms are 15 miles and 12 miles out. And those apply for more organized, maybe a cluster or a line of thunderstorms, and those that are fast moving, a more organized cluster that's moving towards the event. The more, more confidence you have that a storm's going to impact an event, the larger the radius and the more time you should give your fans to take cover. And then for resumption of play, you'll notice we go, we do go back to six miles um, with storms moving away from that. And that, that was kind of weighing uh, some challenges that have happened at outdoor events with resumption of play. We've had a lot of long delays for those that have waited for eight, ten plus miles for storms to move out of those radi radii areas. And really what we found in most cases as storms are moving away, if once you make that decision that the storm has moved beyond six miles away, you can go ahead and and, and start looking at the resumption of play. And that that is only if lightning has moved beyond the six-mile radius and you haven't had any lightning observed for the past 30 minutes. We have that for the daytime, but at night you can see lightning from much further away. So in the day uh, at nighttime, we we encourage folks at at outdoors venues to use the six-mile radius and having no thunder observed in the last 30 minutes, the combination of the two. So this outdoor venue safety plan really motivates venues to pursue a lightning safety plan. And, and, and we can really be proactive with them and approach them. And, and it's not just National Weather Service meteorologists. It's anyone here on the call. If you have a local venue, you should approach them and let them know that the Weather Service has plans that are out there that they can easily edit and make their, make their own. So we're really teaching them how to utilize the toolkit. And then they can submit their plan to the National Weather Service and we'll recognize them for their efforts. So who's eligible to get to complete a lightning safety plan? Well, all these, as mentioned, all these outdoor facilities ranging from a large stadium that might hold 100,000 people to a little league facility that may only have 20 people in attendance. So all the different range and of types of events and venues can, can have a lightning safety plan. The way the Lightning Safety Toolkit is set up is that it has the keys to preparing a venue, which include information reception. How is the venue getting weather information, whether it be from uh, a commercial service provided by America's weather industry, from a, a weather radio, like you see our weather radio there, from a TV source. Uh, there's a lot of different sources. Mobile phones now have great applications. Um, a lot of different resources that can be provided that are laid out in this plan. And then once you find that information that storms are going to impact your, your venue, you need to have decision support standards in order to say at, at what distance will lightning be a way that we need to make certain decisions. If there's a tornado warning, what decisions need to be made? If there's a severe thunderstorm warning, what decisions need to be made? So that's, the plan helps lay that out. Uh, and then public notification plans are a really important part of that. What does the public address system announcer say? And, and the plan has uh, already drafted up draft uh, phrases for that they can use and apply at their local venue. And it also includes a protection plan. Where do you send people after you've made the announcements? Where do you where do you direct them to for safety? And also the education aspect of informing spectators well before the event that there's a lightning threat and that they might have to evacuate that day. So the toolkit's broken up into a very very active plan that is broken down to what do you do before the event, what does a venue do, what are they doing during the event for weather monitoring, and, and it addresses the lightning decisions points, the radii, and after the event, how can we look at what worked and what didn't work, and how can we improve for future delays. I've been talking about these lightning radii rings several times, so I just wanted to hit on this. The eight mile uh, radius is the bare minimum that NOAA recommends that a delay be called. So if lightning is within eight miles of a venue, we definitely, definitely recommend that the venue should be delayed because lightning can easily strike uh, within that radius if the thunderstorm's nearby. And, and, and just the example I have here, you see the main uh, cluster uh, and of uh, thunderstorms is off. Most of it's out between 12 and 15 miles away, but you do see some isolated strikes there uh, out ahead of it. 
um, and what looks like more of a stratiform region that uh, that are close closer to the venue within that radius. So that's why um, we also have recommendations. You know, as I mentioned, if a storm is more organized, we want venues to be more proactive and call for delays when lightning is 12 or 15 or even more uh, out from a venue. Another thing that's really, really important, and this is something that I've been focusing more and more efforts on now, is the consistency of messaging at an event. You've got officials on the field that are going to be making an announcement that a game has been stopped. You've got athletic, uh, you've got athletic directors in college sports that are making decisions on the delay. You have the importance of the venue messaging, the right message, stadium operations, monitoring and making decisions. You've got event staff that are directing people where to go. They need to be informed. And then you have the media, as I mentioned before, that, that really need to give a consistent message uh, and can't be giving mixed messages of putting people down on the field during a delay. And What they're saying is so important because you have people sitting out in their tailgates or maybe watching the coverage before they decide to go in uh, or, or people at home that may be texting people at the game. And they, they're making announcements uh, the announcers are about lightning delays and it's important that they get the messaging right and that it's accurate. So we have seen uh, a couple events, there was a Mississippi State college football game that was had lightning in the area and the announcer actually said, well we've had lightning but we haven't had thunder yet so we're going to keep playing. And so you, obviously that wasn't the correct message and so what I'm looking at is, is finding ways to educate the media and get uh, media producers together to ensure that their broadcasters are, are giving the right message because obviously they're not meteorologists and we want to make sure they have the right messaging for delays. Another piece of this is security. Um, they'll be, they, they can be a big piece in helping clear the stands. Sometimes we'll do, uh, venues will do security sweeps in order to get the stand, uh, folks out of the stands. Another piece of the plan is, is having an evacuation plan. This is, I mentioned University of Tennessee had a delay against Oregon uh, several years ago, and uh, they, they've taken a lot of great proactive measures since that delay, and here's their maps they developed for how to route, uh, how to route spectators during a delay. And one thing that I think is really nice is on this, in this right graphic, you'll see that the Thompson Bowling Arena uh, is that green box, and then some of their other local campus facilities where classes are, are the bottom right. Uh, and those, it clearly states, you know, where the safe shelters are, the completely fully enclosed structures. So that helps route people to a safe place during a delay. So what are, are what is a, the definition of, of a safe structure? It's a large, substantial building that's fully enclosed, grounded, wiring and plumbing that that take any kind of electrical strike and we'll take that electricity and take it down to the ground. Uh, and also what a safe structure must surround a person completely like that Faraday cage that I had mentioned before. So that way the lightning can't strike through it. Uh, it needs to be completely fully enclosed. Uh, also safe vehicles. Um, buses are very safe. Metal top vehicles uh, are, are safe. Buses are great for like high school events, especially you can get you know many fans and, and spectators for say a soccer game. Uh, you can get them in a bus quickly and a lot of times there aren't a lot of safe places to go um, for smaller events and so a bus is a great way to get all of those in attendance to a safe place quickly. Uh, unsafe places include soft top convertibles uh, with fiberglass bodies, cloth tops, Golf carts aren't safe, and uh, obviously bicycles are, and motorcycles are not safe either. So again, resuming activities, we have the rule of lightning has left six mile radius, it's moving away, and there's no thunder or lightning observed. There are um, some really good things that you guys can get involved with with your events with education opportunities. Uh, when I was a forecaster at Pittsburgh, we did Pittsburgh Pirates Weather Day, and I know a lot of other Major League Baseball teams are doing this with their local forecast offices to have kids' days where they have a weather booth and they talk about weather safety. And when we worked with the Pittsburgh Pirates, we actually got their mascot involved and, and uh, the, the pirate parrot. And the pirate parrot put uh, I had a raincoat on and was holding a weather radio and had the When Thunder Roars Go Indoors uh, hat on it on its head and and the kids loved it and so not only are you engaging the kids with with uh, the pirate parrot which they love but they're learning about weather safety as well so these are great events that uh, outdoor venues can have and and you know really a, an important part is making announcements 
leading up to the game, whether it be on the radio, on TV, for those coming into the venue, but also making a public address announcements at the game, both before and during the game. If you're anticipating that thunderstorms will move into the venue, we want stadiums to be making announcements so people can prepare. And there may be cases where, you know, uh, we've learned that it takes, uh, there may be cases where it takes people longer to evacuate and even they might want to evacuate before a delay if storms are coming because it takes them longer to evacuate. Folks that don't move around as quickly, um, we've, we've, I've gotten a best practice from uh, West Virginia University that they said, hey, we, we really need to evacuate our handicap areas first because it takes them longer to evacuate. We need to give them more time so they can get to safety. And then putting information in the programs and, and having weather applications are things that we recommend for, uh, for our venues. So you can access the toolkit from www.lightningsafety.noaa.gov. And here's an example of what it looks like. It's a Word document, as I mentioned, that can be edited for that individual venue's needs. And you'll notice in this page here that there are areas that are grayed out. And that's where the venue can take it and customize it and edit it to what they need specifically. So we do, do, rec we do recognition ceremonies uh, where we'll recognize an outdoor organization or the venue for having a lightning safety plan. There I'm uh, with Major League Baseball. Uh, Director of Facility Operations Paul Hanlon, uh, recognizing Major League Baseball for being taking pro proactive measures for lightning safety, and they're actually working with a, a private sector company, and will be making more decisions from their central headquarters at Major League Baseball headquarters coming up this th this season. That's something they're really excited about. In the past, they were letting umpires on the field make the decisions. And the umpires were getting information between innings. Uh, and then during an inning, say if a storm developed or was moving quickly toward the venue, the umpires had no access to data. But yet they were the ones in charge of calling for delays. So we saw a lot of close calls at, at Major League Baseball events. And Major League Baseball has had enough, seen enough of this. And so they'll be making more calls from their headquarters at a central location. We would have it done at the, they would have it done at individual venues. However, then the home team advantage comes in and pitching and rest and those type of things come in. So they wanted to take that element out completely. So we, the Weather Service local offices will do recognition ceremonies. Here's one that uh, the WFO Cleveland did, the Weather Forecast Office in Cleveland. We've got uh, Karen Odeman and Gary Garnett are our two Weather Service employees there. Uh, in the right there, Gary's wearing the suit and Karen's got the black Weather Service shirt on. They're there with Bowling Green State University representatives uh, recognizing them. And they actually were able to go out on their field during a timeout and do the recognition on the field during one of their Tuesday night football games. So something really cool they did with Bowling Green State to get more exposure to this program and get more exposure to lightning safety to the spectators that were in attendance. So we also have a lightning safety plan for golf courses and venues, uh, even driving, uh, driving ranges. Uh, you know, golfers obviously are some of the most uh, stubborn people because they just love golf so much they don't want to leave the course, even if storms are approaching. And there have been a lot of examples of people struck out on golf courses. Actually, at an, in, I believe it was in 1996 at the PGA Championship at Crooked Stick in Indiana, a spectator was struck by lightning and killed during the PGA Championship. So these are very, very serious things, and golfers are struck by lightning. Almost every year we tend to see a, a golfer or someone at, an, at a sporting event, not, not necessarily a venue, but doing a recreational activity who's struck by lightning and unfortunately killed. So we have this plan now for golf courses, and a pro shop, uh, they can take, take on, or some of the larger organizations that host major golf tournaments can develop their own lightning safety plans. And so the chart you see here is a radii chart that can help a golf course determine how much time they should give, uh, in or how much, what kind of radius they should look at, and how much time they should give in order to call for a delay. So, example, uh, let's look at the if we look at the Y column here, uh, go all the way to the bottom left. That's the maximum distance of a lightning strike from the course. And if we say, uh, uh, or the maximum distance of a shelter from a a patron who's on the course or a golfer who's on the course. So say there's not a shelter within one mile from where that person is out on the golf course. If you have a storm that's say moving 40 miles per hour, if we go straight down the column here down to a mile, the maximum, uh, the lightning distance that they should really be taking action is 11 miles away. So this 
helps a golf course plan, okay, what is the largest distance we have where a golfer is away from uh, from a shelter and how long would it take them to get there? So they can adjust their radii on when they need to take action. You'll notice our minimum is eight uh, in the upper left here and then we go all the way down to 15. So depending on the distance, we've got this radii chart developed. They also, they worked on this, uh, Evan Bentley is our point of contact on this at the Northern Indiana office soon moving out to Portland to be a forecaster out there. And uh, Evan, Evan uh, worked with their local uh, Mal Max Welton golf course to develop these signs that went out and actually went on all of their uh, scorecards and also on their golf carts. So they have this information posted on where lightning safe shelters are and where uh, so what some of the definitions are for weather sirens. So when they have one prolonged uh, siren at the golf course, play is discontinued. If there's three consecutive notes, then that means they really need to be discontinuing play. And then they have one for resume play. We also have a lightning safety plan that was developed for community preparedness. And uh, this was developed by Karen Odeman, a forecaster in, uh, in Cleveland, Ohio. And it uh, really can lay out for a, a camp. We've had the Shenandoah camp uh, in, in Virginia. It's a Boy Scout and Girl Scout camp, have a lightning safety plan there. And so it really, this could be applied at uh, festivals, fairs, outdoor concerts are the ones that are really good and eligible to complete this, this plan. As I mentioned before, we also have a, a lightning safety plan for beach patrols and lifeguards. We've developed a partnership with the United States Life Saving Association where we can assist lifeguard agencies to help them design a lightning safety plan. And so we also worked with the United, the Weather Service worked with the United States Life Saving Association on the Break the Grip of the RIP program. And so this is another program that we can work together with them on ensuring that there are plans not just for beaches but for also for uh, private pools for lifeguards to make sure they have lightning lightning safety plans in place. So that involves a toolkit as well. I did mostly focusing on lightning safety throughout this presentation, but I did want to mention we do have storm ready venues. A venue can become storm ready working with their local National Weather Service office. It is a more thorough involved program that involves uh, verification visits and recertification uh, and, and really a, a pretty pretty stringent criteria to help a venue ensure they have all their plans in place, including setting up an emergency operations center and a warning point. So in a lot of cases, Storm Ready um, may be a little bit too stringent uh, for what a venue is capable of. Storm Ready support is a little bit easier for them to, to do. Um, but we have, had, we have still had some venues become Storm Ready, and we encourage our venues to become Storm Ready if they can. So they did a recognition ceremony after the Green Bay Packers became Storm Ready up there at Lambeau Field. The last program I want to talk about today is uh, the Weather Ready Nation Ambassador. And everyone can get involved with the Weather Ready Nation Ambassador program. And, and you guys on, on this call, you, you all can help your local organization become a Weather Ready Nation Ambassador, whatever that organization may be. And the idea of, of becoming a Weather Ready Nation Ambassador is that you're getting, you're linked in with the Weather Service, you apply, uh, you, you fill out a form, and you get email information from the Weather Service on preparedness weeks, on major high impact events, and it gives you the open door to work with the Weather Service on preparedness projects. And so it really helps them, helps an organization take take ownership of Weather Ready Nation and, and helping people take action. So for example, we have uh, uh, Property Casualty who is a Weather Ready Nation ambassador uh, retweeting and tweeting about weather safety for um, based off a post that came out of the Storm Prediction Center. They're retweeting the Storm Prediction Center. So this gives private organizations, large companies, uh, opportunities to really help our, our nation become more resilient to high impact weather events. And so they can also, they have direct interaction with us for data access if they need specific information on weather. It really fosters these collaboration opportunities. So we're touching base with these organizations more often and helping them prepare for outdoor events by uh, developing plans. So we've developed a lot of great partnerships uh, through the years with outdoor organizations. We, I just actually met with Major League Soccer two weeks ago at the Stadium Managers Association meeting, and that's one that you don't see up here that we're still developing the relationship with, but obviously a very vulnerable group as well. And uh, if we look at the value of these partnerships, here's all the different organizations. We've got 
we've met with the NFL, we've met with Major League Baseball, United States Life Saving Association, and we've got several different organizations that bring venues together that we're really having these focused discussions, really important discussions to have. And we also have recognitions with the University of Maryland, upper left, and the, uh, Georgia Tech, who have both completed lightning safety plans. I will say, when a venue completes a lightning safety plan, it does not need to be verbatim what our toolkit looks like. Bowling Green State did a version that was pretty much verbatim. They took the template and just changed the colors to match up with their colors and uh, filled it in for their local needs. But uh, University of Maryland, for example, and Georgia Tech both did some variations, but had the basic parts that were from the, uh, the toolkit in their plans, and so we recognized them for their, good, their great efforts. And also, we've got the great thing about the Weather Ready Nation Ambassador Initiative. It gets all kinds of organizations across the country involved in planning and sharing information. And, and I, I view this as meteorologists from the Weather Service. We can't help with preparedness all alone. We can't do this all alone. We need you guys out there involved as an extension arm uh, uh, for preparedness and telling more and more people about the threats of, say, a, a hurricane making landfall, explaining what storm surge is, letting them know that lightning can strike, you know, 10 miles from a venue. That's, that's being a Weather Ready Nation ambassador, sharing weather safety information to partners. And so we've got a lot of great organizations. And, and our first list here is mostly uh, organizations involved with the Weather Water Climate Enterprise. But if you go over, you can see it gets a lot more. We go far beyond that. We've got uh, Carlsbad Caverns, the Three Rivers Park District. We've got... Uh, uh, Schlitterbahn Water Park, Bismarck Public Schools, a very wide variety of different organizations that have become Weather Ready Nation ambassadors. One cool thing we've done with the Minnesota Vikings, who are Weather Ready Nation ambassador, uh, we actually have two NFL teams at last look, the Miami Dolphins and the Minnesota Vikings are Weather Ready Nation ambassadors. And what we did is we worked with them to create a public safety announcement. So I'm going to play that public safety announcement for you. Hi, I'm John Sullivan with the Minnesota Vikings. Just as we prepare and plan for our opponent, I'm asking you to do the same when it comes to the weather. Before coming to TCF Stadium, listen to the weather forecast and be prepared for the expected weather conditions. In other words, be sure to drive and dress accordingly. We want everyone to enjoy their time here at TCF this season, so let's all prepare to ensure victory and be weather ready. So this is a great example. Notice the Minnesota Vikings are on there with us and have weather.gov slash safety on there. So a really nice example of how we can join our preparedness efforts together um, and build a weather-ready nation. And uh, here's another example, lower right picture of uh, uh, a video display board that says when flooded, turn around, don't drown. So utilizing uh, familiar faces, they really have that power of influence with preparedness. I will say, uh, things that we do for decision support. All the things I've been talking about today are outreach preparedness activities. They're not the active decision support that we do with our core partners in, emer in the emergency management community, other government agencies, and a subset of the broadcast sector. Um, we will provide on-site support at national special security events, also called NSSCs, and also events that are special event assessment rating uh, SEER Level 1 events, the, the Department of Homeland Security designates these events, and we are there providing emergency management and government officials weather updates, uh, and, and we're there for events just like we're there for the Super Bowl supporting the Department of Homeland Security. So that's an example of where we do support uh, at emergency operations centers, airports, and mobile commands for large events where there might be you know, you might not think of the San Francisco Bay Area as being a big weather threat, and this year really wasn't. However, um, there could be an event such as a, a, an explosion from a bomb uh, or, or something that occurs, maybe an earthquake even, where you're going to want a weather service employee on hand. An emergency manager is going to want them on hand to provide them with the latest with the weather and how it's going to impact them. So I'll go back to my original slide and say, you know, we're really not there yet, obviously. What we've seen is these major impacts to large outdoor venues. We have to continue preparedness. This isn't something that will go away. Different people will get into these positions as years pass, and we'll continue to need to push weather safety preparedness with them. So moving forward, we've got, uh, I've got all our different lightning plans laid out here, but we're also developing one now for the boating and fishing communities with an organization called U.S. Sailing. 
So we're really excited about that, having a plan for boats. So what can uh, you guys do now? Work with stadium managers um, uh, and let them know that these plans exist. Um, the Weather Service can actually do Skywarn spotter training uh, at for venue managers that want to get involved with that. Um, encourage them to w work with their local emergency management and the Weather Service to ensure that thorough plans are in place. That they can use this lightning safety plan uh, and then they, they can get when Thunder Roars go indoors signs. As a result of becoming uh, completing the lightning safety plan, you get a when Thunder Roars go indoors sign. So that consistent messaging with the broadcast media, we've got to continue to educate the broadcast media on, on what to say and what the right things are to do for delays. And lastly, encourage them to become Weather Ready Nation ambassadors. So thank you all for your time today. And I, I think we have a, a little bit of time for questions. And I'm happy to take your questions. My email address is up here. So if you have any further questions uh, that aren't addressed on this call, feel free to email me. And we also have our links to our three different outdoor preparedness programs, Lightning Safety, Storm Ready, and Weather Ready Nation Ambassadors. Thank you all. Thanks, Charlie. And we'll put those links on our website as well for you folks uh, out there to, to take a look at those. Uh, if you want to type in a question, go ahead. We'll take those. I've got a, a couple quick ones for you, Charlie. Um, uh, other countries, are, are they uh, doing the same thing now? Are they starting to get involved in those soccer stadiums around the world? and and uh, other outdoor stadiums. Is there a pro are there programs like this going on? Yeah, it's 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 good you you bring that up because actually we we don't have we are working on uh, building weather ready nations. There's a more of an international approach that's now being taken towards uh, uh, community resiliency all across the globe. However, the lightning safety plan and storm ready programs have been focused. Uh, just here in the United States and to our territor uh, territories, U.S. territories. So really there is an opportunity to expand this internationally. Um, we could, uh, you know, there's, there's opportunities to obviously expand into Canada. We've got professional teams. I've uh, met and I've met the Toronto Blue Jays before um, at, at the stadium manager's meeting before and talked about lightning safety with them. And uh, overseas as well, there's... Uh, the uh, ATP and WTA, our international tennis associations, have expressed interest in uh, developing lightning safety plans uh, policy for their organization. So we we haven't really, I'd say we just we've just scratched the surface there, and there's a lot of potential uh, for international engagement on uh, preparing large outdoor venues for uh, whatever high impact weather could have, could uh, hit there locally. You know, it reminds me back when I was in high school. I remember being out there playing baseball, and the storms were coming in, and, you know, you talk to the coach or the umpire, and they'd say, whoa, whoa, hey, look up there. That's all blue sky. They'd be pointing in the opposite direction. Get back and get back out there. Don't worry about it. And then, you know, 20 minutes later, we're getting lightning jumping around and stuff. So a lot of times those leading the these uh, – in charge may not be aware of, of what is what. So, um, uh, one other question, and then we'll go to. We're starting to get a couple questions in here. So, um, or actually, it's a double question here. Uh, is there enough room in some of these stadiums to shelter folks? So, you think about a place like Michigan that holds a hundred thousand people in the stands. Uh, I've gone to some football stadiums underneath. There's not a lot of room under there. Uh, and then the second question, follow up with the false alarm rate. So we get ready, it's coming in, and then there's nothing, and then do people become complacent? Those are great questions. Uh, the is there enough room? A lot of cases, stadiums don't have enough room to provide complete, fully enclosed shelters, uh, structures for, for people to take shelter in. So the answer is, a lot of cases, no, there isn't enough room in venues, and they have to find other facilities nearby or vehicles and send spectators to those locations. And so having a plan on where to send people is a lot better than just saying, get out of the stadium. Uh, for the false alarm rate, I would say that, uh, yes, uh, you, we. that's why we've been very careful with these radii. Uh, of course, as meteorologists, we'd love to say 10, 15, 20 miles ra radius, but there is that complacency issue, and a lot of times it's a tough decision to make where a storm is just maybe just skirting past that eight-mile radius, and um, 
may just just barely get within that radius. Is it really worth it for that venue? And they have to do a risk assessment and really make that decision. Uh, so they don't have a lot of false alarms. I mean, if you have a storm that passes just maybe seven miles away and just skirts uh, along the radius of the of the venue, there is going to be a lightning threat. Lightning could still strike the venue. However, the perception of those in attendance at the event are, hey, it's the sun's still out here. We can see the storm in the distance, but it's not hitting us. It never hit us. It never rained. We're not going to listen to your delays in the future because they're nonsense. So it is really tough to to manage the false alarm rates because there there are a lot of cases where storms just just miss the stadium. And so it's something that venue managers are constantly dealing with. They've got to make sure if they're going to call for that delay that, that there are going to be impacts. And so we, I keep reminding them, and our, our community, can, the lightning safety community, continues to remind them that lightning can strike. Uh, most lightning strikes are within five miles of a thunderstorm. Lightning can strike five to ten miles out, and bolts from the blue could be out as far as 20 miles, maybe even more. Thanks. We've, I think we've got Nolan Duskin with us on uh, on our call today. Nolan, do you want to tell a quick story about the the event here at the football game you were at and the the the, uh, the uh, first aid tent getting struck? Yeah. Do you hear me? Okay. You sound great. Okay. Uh, yeah. Uh, this the situation, Charlie, that I dealt with is one that would be. Ooh, a lot of asterisks in terms of the, the sort of plans. It, it was occurring, it took place before the game, during, even before pre-game activities. People were only just beginning to go out into the stadium, but, but they, uh, many football uh, venues have big tailgating activities and, and larger tents with big groups gathering. That's what we had. People weren't even going into the stadium yet. The storm didn't come from anywhere. It developed in situ directly overhead during non-convective appearing sky, just stratiform, uh, low clouds, cool upslope weather here on the front range. And then the first bolt of the storm occurred directly over the parking lot, and about the first 10 to 15 bolts were all within a mile of the stadium, all in the parking areas. and and many of the people for the tailgating and pregame activities didn't even have tickets to get in the stadium. And many of the stadium ticket takers, their posts were exposed, not under the stadium, but out at the top of stairs coming into the stadium. Uh, people turned to me knowing I was uh, the weather expert, say, what do we do? Lightning striking all the way around. And we were in in metal poled po uh, tents, and uh, as as Henry suggested, uh, there was we didn't know at the time, but there was in fact a, a medical attention tent that got struck. It was a, a nursing staff was was not killed but injured, and that wasn't known until after the game. It was not widely publicized, so. It was like a nightmare of activities, not to mention there was then heavy rains and flooding. The lightning began before the rain, so people weren't taking shelter from rain. Uh, yeah, 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 there was no, again, the very first lightning bolt anywhere in the state was over the stadium. What do you do? Yeah, that's something that uh, a lot of Major League Baseball and, and I know college baseball teams deal with in the spring season and particularly in the summer months, especially when you have that summertime sea breeze uh, development of thunderstorms that occurs, you know, in the southeast and, and it really can occur in the summertime air mass, really anywhere a storm develops quickly overhead. And, and the, the best thing you can do is having a plan to be, to, to mitigate chaos, knowing w what at that moment when that first lightning strike occurs, if it's overhead, what do we do immediately? What, what, what actions do we take? And helping mitigate that chaos by providing a lot of information, um, having a plan of knowing where people. Obviously, as soon as that lightning strikes, everyone's a danger. There's not much. If, if it's the first storm to develop and it's a strike that just developed overhead, it's the first strike, you're not going to be able to anticipate that so much. But, but also understanding the forecast for that day, uh, knowing there's the possibility of thunderstorms, and knowing, like, we may need to 
jump quickly into action. And also, we like to encourage venues, if they have a meteorologist on site, uh, whether it be someone from the local university or a private sector meteorologist, we encourage them to designate a, a meteorologist on the site on site to help them make those decisions. I'll say that the PGA at uh, events, uh, I know Schneider Electric provides them with their lightning support on site. They've got two meteorologists. Uh, I know at the PGA Championship, they've got two meteorologists that sit in a in a in a in a little um, tent or not a tent, but you know it's a fully enclosed trailer that's a safe place for them, and they can uh, safe from lightning at least. Um, and they're there monitoring lightning. And they actually set up field mills there uh, on site to help uh, detect the electrical charge overhead. And they have equipment that can, even before the first lightning strike occurs, detect when there is an electrical charge and there's the potential for a lightning strike overhead. So there are some options for um, that are being used by the PGA as far as detecting lightning and being able to foresee that overhead strike coming as the first strike. Thanks, Charlie. Okay, let's well, let's go ahead and get some of the questions. We've got a bunch of them coming in here from folks. Uh, Tom writes. Tom has two questions for you. Uh, I, I think Tom is from Nebraska, and he wanted to know on a golf course um, what to do. So you mentioned to to go towards a shelter. You know, a lot of times you're on. It's a long walk. It's a long way out there on a golf course. Should should the golfers uh, stay in the cart? Should they uh, should they uh, crouch down, what, what should they do, go to the nearest ditch? Uh, that's one question he had. The other one was uh, a lot of time they camp on the beach, uh, places in Nebraska where there's not a lot of trees. Uh, tornado warning comes. Should the campers uh, stay in the camper RV or should they get out? What should they do? So, so two outdoor spots, uh, different, but uh, if you have any advice on that. The first one uh, is if you're out on a golf course and there's lightning, you need to, at, at the moment when there's lightning, if you have a golf cart or if you're walking, you need to just stop what you're doing and head towards shelter. N having an idea of where the shelters are on course, some courses don't have shelters, some do, um, and, and just heading back to the clubhouse immediately. That's the best thing you can do. Um, and remember that being in your golf cart isn't a safe place to be. You need to take your golf cart all the way to a shelter that's fully grounded, fully enclosed, and find that shelter. For the um, camping on the beach question, that's not as easy of a question because um, some would make the argument that if uh, you have a thunderstorm that's coming through and it's got heavy rains with it, you're outside, you're at the threat of a lightning strike if you go to a ditch, uh, or you, there could be flash flooding and you could be you waters come come up quickly if you're in a ditch. So you really have to gauge it. You know, having weather as much weather information as you can get, having a weather radio, having uh, a weather application provided by America's weather weather industry. There's all kinds of great applications out there for smartphones to be able to monitor and judge. Um, there may be a case where uh, the smarter thing to do is if it were if it's uh, most tornadoes of any strength could mostly damage, knock over, or, or pick up a vehicle. So a vehicle is not a safe safe place to be, but you kind of have to weigh your hazards there if you're out in the open off on your own, is can we get can we get to a shelter that's more safer than a vehicle? Can Maybe, maybe the smartest thing to do is dr drive the RV to a shelter before the storm hits. Uh, you really just got to kind of do a risk assessment of, what are the possible threats that could happen here? Is it worth it? Um, and going into a ditch obviously is very risky because then you're out exposed to the lightning threat uh, or flash flooding, or and then at the same time the camper could get knocked over. So best advice would be find a, a fully enclosed shelter where you can get to the lowest level uh, in an interior spot if there's a tornado threat. Joe writes in, and he wants follow up to that. Is he wants to know what about safety on a sailboat if you're offshore? What do you do there? Yeah, that's a great question, and that's what we're currently working on a plan for the fishing community and the sailing community. We haven't published the plans yet. We're still working on them. What do you do? Because um, when you're out on the open waters, you're you're clearly the highest point. 
lightning tends to strike the tallest point. Uh, so you're on a flat surface on the water. If you're on your boat, odds are lightning's going to go towards that sailboat with that mast. You want to you want to stay away from the mast. Uh, you definitely want it because it's the highest point. And keep in mind that that mast may come all the way down through the boat. So if you do have a cabin in your boat, you'd want to get into your cabin, but stay away from where that mast may come through. You want to stay away from metal as much as you can. Uh, obviously. You know, watching the best advice is to watch the weather forecast before you go sailing to ensure that uh, if there are thunderstorms, that you're not going to be out when the thunderstorms are are, are occurring. But if the, in the un, unfortunate event where you get caught out there, um, best advice is to try to get back to shore. Uh, if you can't get back to shore, go inside the cabin. Try to stay away from all metal and stay away from the mast. Okay, thanks. Here, here's one, and, and we're gonna we're running short on time, so we're gonna just take a few more, and then Charlie can answer the rest of these uh, by email. What about that? Here's a person that uh, hot small hot air uh, balloon competitors okay, and those type of events can they get a certification? That's one we haven't considered yet. Uh, hot air balloon organizations. I'm definitely gonna write that down. I would I would think they could they could do if it were for an event they could do the lightning safety plan for outdoor venues. Um, it's going to be important for them to be watching the forecast, monitoring the forecast before the event. The winds obviously are going to be really important in addition to the development of thunderstorms. We also have sometimes at these events they're like at fairs and you have spectators watching the launches that are involved with that. Um, yeah, we, we would open up the opportunity for a balloon organization or a balloon company to, uh, or maybe a balloon event to become a Weather Ready Nation ambassador. And if they want to do a lightning safety plan, that's something we could modify the toolkit uh, so they could do it. Happy to work with them on that. Carolyn is, is part of, uh, in Southern California, uh, in the Morago Basin, in the desert there, she's wondering uh, is that uh, do you, she's part of the CERT uh, response team there. Do you have a video program for us, for those folks out there that they could use? So we don't have a video recording program, although I, I think this may be recorded, and so perhaps, Nolan, that w you, could, you could share this recording with them and uh, they could watch that as far as what learning what some of the best practices are. Also, we're happy, our local weather service offices are happy to do preparedness talks, outreach talks for organizations. So depending on where their local forecast office is, uh, I think you said Southern California, so it's probably San Diego or Oxnard, which covers the Los Angeles area. Um, you can work with your local forecast office and reach out to them, and uh, they can help you with local preparedness. Okay, we're going to take two more. Tim wants to know um, about these handheld lightning detectors. Um, what, what do you think about them? Do, do they detect uh, cloud to ground lightning only, or do they pick up cloud to cloud as well? And, and uh, I, I guess another question is, if there's just cloud to cloud going on, should you worry about uh, uh, being hit with lightning? I'll answer the cloud to cloud question first. Yes, if there's cloud to cloud lightning, you could easily you have those. Uh, elect, uh, you have those particles, those uh, charged particles up in the up in the cloud. Yes, you could easily have a cloud to ground strike if you have a cloud to cloud strike. Um, as far as handheld, there are a lot of different products that are available out there. Um, it's important to read through the instruction manuals that come with those and what their capabilities are and what knowing what their error is. Um, what the margin of error is on a handheld because sometimes they just pick up an electrical charge um, and they have been, I've heard some are great and work really well and I've heard examples of a, a pager going off that has that type of a, a detection device where it's kind of like a handheld and uh, going off when there's no lightning nearby at all. So you just have to be careful with those kind of devices if there's a way you can test it in a trial stage to get comfortable with it, that probably would be a good way to go. Okay, here's one from Virginia. You mentioned about cars. What about cars with sunroofs? Are they safe from lightning, uh, even if the sunroof is not closed? The sunroof, if the sunroof's not closed, it's, the car's not safe. 
if any windows are open, the car is not safe. You have to have it fully enclosed. So if there's a sunroof and it's fully enclosed, the windows closed, yes, you're safe. You might be really scared if lightning strikes your car. It, it wouldn't be an enjoyable experience, but we haven't had any reports where someone was in a fully enclosed vehicle and was killed by lightning. Well, Charlie, we want to thank you again for taking the time. Folks, a uh, couple of questions we haven't been able to answer, but Charlie will follow up with you here in the next uh, week or so with the answers to those. Uh, again, we really appreciate you taking the time. Fascinating subject, something I've always been interested in. And, uh, you know, this is great. Uh, Kokoros is a weather-ready uh, nation. We're partner with that. And actually, by doing this, we're hoping to get that word out more on, on lightning safety. So, again, Charlie, thank you for, for being with us today and, and really, really important stuff. We will post Charlie's presentation slides as well as links on our website. We'll hopefully have those up later on today. And this is recorded, so you can watch that and pass this on to others uh, that'll be on our website on the YouTube channel as well. So, um, well, uh, folks, I, I want you to mark your calendars. Uh, almost a month from today, a little less than a month away, we're going to have a really another exciting uh, Coco Ross Weather Talk webinar. WKRG TV's Chief Meteorologist Alan Seals, and many of you may know him, will give us a personal look at the day in the life of a TV meteorologist. And this is one we've been hoping to have for a long time. And uh, that'll be coming up again March 24th. You can go on our website and sign up for that now. Uh, finally, when signing off today, please take the short survey that's going to pop up on your screen. Uh, again, we thank you for being with us. So until next time, this is Henry Regis for the rest of the Kokoros team. We're going to say goodbye. Uh, have a good weekend coming up, and have a great afternoon. Thanks. <laughs>